Hello, everyone. This is the 34th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we continue our interview series with Mr. John O'Carroll as we discuss the matches of the Republic of Ireland national team during the 1984-85 season. Last time we left off in the summer of 1984 with the Republic of Ireland participating in a tournament in Japan. It had been a disappointing season with no clear signs of improvement. The 1984-85 season was the start of the 1986 Mexico World Cup qualifiers. Republic of Ireland were in Group 6 with the Soviet Union, Denmark, who had just impressed in the 1984 Euros, Norway, and Switzerland. Already, the task seemed difficult as the Soviets were strong and the Danish, after the Euros, were clear favorites to advance. But first, the season started with a friendly. On August 9th, at Dublin's Delamount Park, Ireland hosted a touring Mexico side. Now, for this match that was played in front of the smallest international crowd at Dublin, just 5,100 people attended this match. We should mention Owen Hand was still the manager of Ireland at this point. Ireland started with Seamus McDonough in goal from Nuts County. He'd be replaced by Jerry Payton of Fulham in the second half. Kieran O'Regan of Brighton. He'd be replaced by Chris Hewton of Tottenham in the 46th minute, who in place would be replaced by Jacko McDonough of Shamrock Rovers in the 76th minute. This would be McDonough's third and final cap. Kevin Morn of Man United. Mick McCarthy, Man City. Jim Beglin of Liverpool. Patrick Byrne of Shamrock Rovers. He'd be replaced by Jerry Daly of Birmingham City in a 46 minute. Capping the side, Tony Grillish of West Bromwich Albion. Jerry Ryan of Brighton. Tony Galvin of Tottenham. He'd be replaced by Kevin O'Callaghan of Ipswich in a 46 minute. Liam Buckley playing for Belgian side Varajem. This would be his second and final cap and Eamon O'Keefe of Portwell. The match ended scoreless. What more can you say about this match, John? Well, Shahan, first of all, pleasure to be on your uh, podcast once again, and, and thank you so much for having me on. Always great to be on. As regards the match, yeah, it was played in early August, and there isn't really an awful lot can be said about the game, really, because there's no highlights available on YouTube. It seems as though the game was played before the domestic seasons in England and Scotland and indeed Europe began. So you'd wonder were players still in pre-season mode uh, when this game was taking place? Because it was um, it was an unusual time uh, to play an international friendly uh, before the domestic seasons uh, started. But as you said, yeah, it was played in front of a small crowd. As you were saying, was it the smallest crowd? That's yet? what it was said, yeah. The lowest crowd yeah, at Dublin. And, yeah. Yeah, and then I suppose maybe in the middle of summer, maybe that played its part too in the fact that there was such a small crowd. But just a couple of points there, Shahan, about the team that you mentioned. As I say, looking at it, I would contend that it was very much an experimental team. Certainly the, the lineup seems to suggest that because, for instance, Mick McHatt, he was only making, was it his, his third or fourth appearance, Jim Bakelin, uh, the same. And there was a few fringe players as well, like Liam Buckley, Keon O'Regan, Jack McDonough. Uh, right, Joe League of Ireland, Ireland players, yeah. yeah, yeah yes, who, who got run, run outs in this game. Now, there was five substitutions made, as you pointed out, and all the subs were made at half time. Now, uh, Jerry Ryan that you mentioned, he played central midfield for Ireland. This was his 18th and also his final cap. And Liam Buckley, as you mentioned, who was playing at this time with Farage in Belgium, this was his second and final cap. And Jack McDonough of Shamrock Rovers, this game was his third cap and also his last one. Now, the substitute goalkeeper, Jerry Payton, uh, that came on at halftime for Jim McDonough, this was actually Jerry Payton's first appearance for Ireland since the infamous game in 1982 against Trinidad. So he sort of, Seamus McDonough, you know, kind of had 
you could say, unbroken service in Gold for Ireland from September of 82 up until this particular friendly. And then, of course, Packy Bonner too had come on the scene as well at this stage. So, I mean, there was even competition, say, when it came to uh, the goalkeeping slot. But as I say, Jerry Payton came on a half and that was his first cap since the game against Trinidad. From a Mexican point of view, I suppose in many ways, the most well-known player at this time, Hugo Sanchez, he did not play in this match. But a couple of players who came to prominence in the 86 World Cup did play, and namely um, Javier Aguirre and also Thomas Boy. And as we'll see, they played a prominent role in Mexico's run to the World Cup quarterfinals uh, in 1986. And we should mention but, they were managed by Bora Milotinovic as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, Bora must have some kind of a record because is it is it four different countries he has taken to four different World Cup final tournaments or, or something like that? Yeah, Mexico, Costa Rica, USA, Nigeria and China, I believe. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Five, yeah. five. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, he certainly has um, a unique claim to uh, fame uh, in that respect. But as regards the game itself, as I say, 5,000 of an attendance, it was really no surprise that the game was in Daily Mount Park. And as I say, an experimental team, uh, no footage on YouTube, which would suggest to me that maybe the game wasn't screened even in highlights format here in Ireland. So there isn't really enough lot more can be said about this particular game, except that he would have served, of course, as a warm-up to the big qualifying game in the following month in September, which was the Republic's opening qualifying game for the 86 World Cup against the Soviet Union. On September 12th at uh, Dublin's Lansdowne Road, the Republic of Ireland started a World Cup qualifiers taking on the Soviet Union. For this match, Owen Hand started with Seamus McDonough in goal, Notts County, John Devine of Norwich City, David O'Leary of Arsenal, Mark Lawrenson of Liverpool, O'Leary and Lawrence will perform the central defensive pairing. Chris Hutton of Tottenham, Ronnie Whelan of Liverpool, Tony Grealish capping the side from West Bromwich Albion, Liam Brady playing for Inter in Italy, Tony Galvin of Tottenham, Mickey Walsh of Porto in Portugal. He'd be replaced by Eamon O'Keefe of Portwell in the 80th minute, the late Michael Robinson of Liverpool. And we should point out that Frank Stapleton missed this match through injury. He was recovering from a knee operation. That's why Mickey Walsh replaced him in the lineup. Kevin Sheedy also had an ankle injury and was unavailable. So Tony Galvin replaced him in the lineup. Also, let me go through the Soviet lineup. Rina Dasaev of Sportok Moscow. Tenji Sulak Belize of Dinamo Tbilisi. Alexander Chivadze, the captain of Dinamo Tbilisi. Sergei Baltachai of Dinamo Kiev, future Ipswich Town player. Anatoly Demyanenko of Dinamo Kiev. Sergei Aleinikov of Dinamo Minsk, future Juventus player. Vladimir Besonov of Dinamo Kiev. He replaced by Andrei Zygmantovich of Dinamo Minsk in the 32nd minute. Gennady Litovchenko of Dnipropetrovsk, the Armenian Horan Oganesian of Ararat Ervan. He'd be replaced by Sergei Gotsmanov of Dinamo Minsk in the 67th minute. The 1975 Ballon d'Or winner Oleg Blochin of Dinamo Kiev. And finally, Sergei Rodionov of Spartak Moscow. And the side was managed by Edward Malofiev. As far as the match itself, Ireland would win 1-0. Walsh would score the winner in the 64th minute. The rundown of the goal was basically Willen would win the ball in midfield and give it to Robinson, who crossed from the right side and Walsh knocked it in. We should also point out that in the 88th minute, the Soviets almost scored an equalizer when Rodionov struck the crossbar. And also Litovchenko had a shot rebounded off the post. So Ireland won, but perhaps maybe they cut the Soviets in an off day, in retrospect, perhaps. At least started the qualifiers in the right foot. What do you remember from this match? Yes, Shahan. Well, 
first of all, uh, the, the full game itself is actually available on YouTube, and it was shown live in Ireland uh, back in September of 1984. So it obviously was a big deal, you know, to have such a team as the USSR coming to Dublin. It was a tea time kickoff. Strange as it may seem, Lansdowne Road actually did not have floodlights, and in actual fact, Lansdowne Road was to not get floodlights until the autumn of 1993. So it's only up to um, the end of 1983 anyway. Any Republic of Ireland international soccer games that were played in Lansdowne Road were, had to be all played during daylight hours, which of course caused its own problems in itself and that many supporters, particularly when the team was going well in the Jack Charlton years, often had to take a day off work to support the team. Anyway, I'll discuss this Soviet game in a moment, but I suppose just to give a quick overview of the qualifying group that Ireland were in for the 86 World Cup, they were in with the Soviet Union, of course, as we know, they were also in with Norway, uh, Switzerland and Denmark. And an interesting point to note is that in the preceding three years, in other words, from 1981 up to 1984, the four opponents that Ireland would face in World Cup qualifying, i.e. Switzerland, Norway, Denmark and the Soviets, had all beaten England you know, either in friendly matches or competitive games. So, I mean, this qualifying group was not going to be an easy group by any stretch of the imagination because, I mean, you had Denmark who really came to prominence at Euro 84. Denmark, of course, had qualified for that tournament by uh, finishing ahead of England. And in Euro 84, they reached the semi-final of it. So they were going to be a serious player in this qualifying group. The Soviet Union, of course, they... As it, okay, they didn't qualify for Euro 84, but they were they were always a strong team. And going into this match against the Republic of Ireland, they were on a 12-game unbeaten run, I believe. And in fact, their, their previous international against England at Wembley, the previous June, had resulted in a 2-0 win for the Soviets. So, I mean, they were obviously a very good team as well. And of course, I mean, Switzerland and Norway... At this time, you could regard them as minnows, but at the same at the same time, they could not be taken for granted because in the 82 World Cup qualifiers, as I said, both Switzerland and Norway had defeated England. So on their day, and particularly when Switzerland and Norway were playing at home respectively, they could be quite sticky opposition for even the best of teams. So it was really a minefield of qualifying group. But as you mentioned, Shahan, the Republic, they certainly commenced this qualifying campaign on the front foot. The uh, 28,000 supporters saw them win 1 0 with the goal that you outlined there after 65 minutes. And um, it's well worth a look at on YouTube because it was a well constructed move and it was finished gloriously by Mickey Walsh. And in an overall sense, this will be remembered as one of the better performances of the Republic of Ireland under Owen Hens' reign as manager. It was a game where the Republic clicked. And you mentioned as well that maybe they cut the Soviets on an off day, which could well be the case too, because a tendency that I've noticed, and indeed this even goes down to the present, is that strong teams and teams that qualify for major tournaments, in their first match, shall we say, the following September after playing in a tournament that summer or whatever, they tend to be vulnerable for some reason. A lot of teams, it seems to take them a game or two to, you, you know, to uh, get up to the pitch of, um, you know, competitiveness again. So, so from that point of view, yeah, maybe it was good from a Republic of Ireland point of view that they played the Soviets in the first game because if they had played the Soviets later on in the campaign, which, which, which as we'll see, they, they did a year later in Moscow, they may not have got the victory. But nonetheless, anyway, it was a fine performance by the Republic. As I said, the USSR, they were on a 12-game unbeaten run coming up to this. And they did go after the win. And Ireland started off on the front foot. Uh, the USSR survived the early Irish pressure. And uh, then they took over for a while. And they also, I believe, had a goal disallowed for offside. So in the second half, anyway, it was very much an even game. But uh, the Republic eventually went into the ascendancy. And of course, in 65 minutes, uh, they scored the winning goal. And as I said already, it is well worth a look on YouTube. So this, anyway, set the Republic of Ireland... It gave him an excellent start to this qualification campaign and it really set him up for what a lot of supporters thought might be a successful qualifying campaign. But alas, as we'll see in the coming games, that was not to be the case. 
Yes, the trouble started as early as the following match. October 17th, when they faced uh, Norway at Oslo. For this match, Owen Hand started with Seamus McDonough of Nuts Counting Goal, John Devine of Norwich. This would be John Devine's 13th and final cap. His first cap was in 1979. David O'Leary of Arsenal, Mark Lawrenson, Liverpool, Chris Hewton, Tottenham, Ronnie Whelan, Liverpool. He replaced by Kevin O'Callaghan of Ipswich in the 67th minute. Captain the side, Tony Grealish, West Bromwich Albion. Liam Brady of Inter in Italy. Tony Galvin of Tottenham. Frank Stapleton back in the side from Man United. This would be a controversial decision, which we'll get to. Michael Robinson of Liverpool. He replaced by... Mick Walsh of Porto in the 69th minute. As far as the Norway side, a couple of familiar faces. You have the future Tottenham goalkeeper, Eric Thorsvet, Aj Harid. He was until recently manager of Denmark national team. He played for yeah, yeah. yeah, Man City and Norwich at some point in the previous years, as well as Halvar Torsen one of the rare Norwegian players who was having a good spell away from home at PSV Eindhoven in Holland. And also our name, Larson Oakland, who was playing at Russian club of Paris in France, but he had also played for Bayer Leverkusen in the previous years. At this point, we have to remind everyone, this was not a Jill Olsen Norway side of the following decade. At this point, Norway had, a lot of uh, non-professional players, a few players who played overseas, but like most Scandinavian nations of that time, they were not fully professional players. So Norway would win this match in a match that many thought was for Ireland for the taking. Pal Jacobson scoring in a 43rd minute. I mentioned how Stapleton's selection was somewhat controversial. It's because he had just recovered from his injury and he was still not fully fit to be a starter at Man United. But he started his match nonetheless ahead of Mickey Walsh, the goal scorer from last month. Some in the press criticized Owen Hand for this decision afterwards. Also, another point to take from this match is that the Liverpool contingent, Lawrenson, Willen, and Robinson had a poor match, and Robinson and Willen would be substituted and yeah. altogether dropped from the next match. So this was an opportunity missed. It was, yeah, no doubt about it. Although, well, a few points to make about it, Jahan. First of all, strange as this may seem, this was actually Norway's fourth qualifying match in the qualifying group, even though we were only at mid-October. Because whatever way the fixtures were scheduled anyway, Norway began their qualifying campaign in September. But from September up to this match, they seem to be playing every second Wednesday. So this was actually their fourth qualifying match. Now, I mean, in Norway's previous three games up to this, they started with a defeat to Switzerland. But they followed that up then with a narrow defeat to Denmark, where they only lost 1-0. And the next game then, which was the game before the Ireland match, they drew 1-1 with the Soviets. So you could say as well that Norway, they were going to be sticky opposition, particularly in Norway. And indeed, even as in found out four years earlier in 1981, when you go to Norway, there's no, certainly in those days anyway, even though they were regarded as one of the minors of European football, nevertheless, when you did go there to play a match, there was no guarantee that you'd come away with the victory. But going back to the Irish perspective then, first of all, this was Ireland's 210th international game. And on hand decides to go with a 4-3-3 formation with Tony Galvin on the left and Robertson on the right. This being out the three up front that I'm referring to. Now, as you mentioned, there was controversy over Frank Stapleton's selection as he had just undergone knee surgery and he was unfit. But on hand... It seems the reason he picked Stapleton was that 
even though Mickey Walsh had scored in the previous game against the Soviets, Mickey Walsh at this time was playing reserve team football with FC Porto. So maybe on hand felt maybe Mickey Walsh should be his last, shall we say, serious test of action would have been the game against the Soviets, whereas in the interim he would have been playing reserve team football. So maybe on hand felt that Mickey Walsh wasn't up to the speed playing regular first team football by then. Now, there was two substitutions uh, made in this game. First of all, on 65 minutes, uh, Kevin O'Callaghan came on for Ronnie Whelan, as you mentioned. And then, actually, at the same time, Nicky Walsh came on for Michael Robinson. This game against Norway was Nicky Walsh's 20th cap. I'll just quote a bit from Owen Hand's autobiography about this game. And what Owen Hand says is that the game plan for this game was to get the ball out wide in order to stretch the play because the Norwegians tended to play a lot through the centre. For the first 30 minutes or so, this tactic worked. As Tony Galvin and Chris Houghton were getting over crosses, Liam Brady had space in the middle. Uh, Ronnie Whelan and Frank Stapleton apparently missed two easy, easy enough chances. Now, for some reason, I suppose after half an hour, Ireland's play then became tentative. Maybe... I suppose maybe, you know, kind of when their opening period of dominance resulted, you know, didn't result in any rewards on the scoreboard, maybe a degree of impatience and maybe a small bit of frustration began to set in. But two minutes before half time, and Norway struck on the counter attack through Pal Jacobs, Jacobsen. And he got goal side of Mark Lonson from a true ball and scored. Now, in the second half, Norway sat in their lead. They camped it inside their own half and remained defensive. Ireland, as a result, were unable to make any meaningful chances, except the late cross from John Define, which Liam Brady failed to reach. In many ways, it was a carbon copy of the Soviet Union game, except the boot was on the other foot. In other words, Ireland would own the press and just could not play through the, the Norwegian defence. Now, as you mentioned, Shahan, for some reason, the Liverpool trio in this game were very disappointing. And two of them, namely Whelan and Robertson, were substituted. And in actual fact, uh, Whelan and Robertson were to play no part in the next game against Denmark. It was a bit baffling, all right, because, I mean, the players that we mentioned, I mean, they were obviously the four with Liverpool. And maybe for some reason, they found it hard to transfer their club farm onto the international stage, which, I mean, was a criticism that was levelled at a lot of Irish players, not just Liverpool players. I mean, the same criticism was levelled at Frank Stapleton and Liam Brady and some others as well, in that the perception seemed to be that these players tended to play better for their clubs rather than their country. It was a really disappointing performance, and, and in many ways it undone the good start of the victory against the Soviet Union. Of course, that meant the pressure was back on own hand ahead of the next game, which was a month later on the 14th of November against Denmark. On November 14th, Denmark, rising power in Europe at Copenhagen, hosted Republic of Ireland. We mentioned earlier how impressive Denmark had been in the 1984 Euros, as well as the previous Euro qualifiers where they had eliminated England. For this match, Owen Hand, starting with Seamus McDonough of Nuts County Goal, Mark Lawrenson of Liverpool, David O'Leary, Arsenal, Mick McCarthy of Man City, Jim Beglin of Liverpool. So Mick McCarthy was in center of defense and Lawrenson shifted to right back in place of Divine. Liam Brady of Inter in Italy, Tony Grillish of West Bromwich Albion, Kevin Sheedy back in the lineup from Everton. Everton would have a magnificent season that season but winning the league title and a cup winner's cup. Tony Galvin of Tottenham. He was replaced by Kevin O'Callaghan of Ipswich in the second half. Frank Stapleton, captain of the side from Man United. And Mickey Walsh of Portuguese club Porto in his 21st and final cap. His first cap had been in 1976. Beglin started at left back in place of Hewton. So there's some lineup changes from previous match, but it was too novel against this strong Danish side. And let's just run through the Denmark side, managed by the West German Sepiontek. 
You have Oleg Kvist of KB, John Sivbeck of Vejle, future Man United player, Morten Olsen, captain the side from Anderlecht, Soren Busk of Belgian club Ghent, Ivan Nilsson of Feyenoord, Klaus Bergren of Italian side Pisa, Jens Bertelsen, French club Rouen. He'd replaced by Jan Molby of Liverpool in the 57th minute. Frank Arneson of Anderlecht. Soren Lerby of Bayern Munich. Michael Laudrup of Lazio in Italy. Preben Elker of Verona in Italy. He replaced by Kenneth Brill of PSV Eindhoven in the 64th minute. The Danish side ran out as 3-0 winners with Elker scoring twice in the 30th and 46th minute. Lerby scoring in the 55th minute. Looking ahead to what happened in the following year, perhaps the Irish got off lightly in this match, in fact. Yeah, you could say that, Shahan. Um, it was a really sobering experience. And just to quickly run down the team again, uh, as I mentioned, there was no Ronnie Whedon or Michael Robinson uh, for this game because they paid the price for their uh, poor displays against uh, Norway. Jim McDonough, the goalkeeper, uh, this was his 20th cap. And actually two players in the defence made their competitive debuts for Ireland, uh, namely Mick McCarthy. This was his fourth cap. But all his three previous caps had all been in friendly games. So this was his first competitive start for the Republic. And also Jim Bakelin, this was his competitive uh, debut for the Republic also, even though he had played a couple of friendly games prior to this. Two players booked, Tony Grealish after nine minutes and Tony Galvin after 20 years. Frank Stapleton, yeah, 40 had capped for him. He also captained the team. One substitution made, Kevin O'Callaghan of Ipswich came on as half time for Tony Galvin. And maybe that could have been down to the fact that maybe Tony was Tony Galvin was carrying a yellow card. So, of course, another yellow would have meant the Republic would have been down to 10 minutes. So maybe that would have been maybe a reason why Tony Galvin was taken off at half time. Apparently, the game plan from an Irish point of view, Shahan, was to contain the Danes and catch them on the counter attack. Now, after 15 minutes, Tony Grealish was fouled in the penalty area, but nothing was given. So maybe if a penalty had been given at that stage, the result could have maybe a little bit different because if the Republic, say, had scored that penalty, it would have given them something to hold on to. But the goals then, after 25 minutes, at Tony Grealish, uh, for some reason, he played a ball backwards, a stray ball. Uh, the ball went right to Elkir's feet, and uh, Elkia got past O'Leary and from the right shot across Seamus McDonough to make it 1-0. Second half then, the second half had just begun when Frank Stapleton was caught in possession on the edge of the ditch penalty area. Then Mark swept up the pitch in a whirlwind move. Laudrup crossed to Elkia in the six-yard box and Elkia flicked up the ball and toe poked it past Jim McDonough for the second goal. And after 55 minutes then, another fire movement a quick fire one, two, and DH the Irish box. Soren Lerby broke free on the left and shot underneath Jim McDonough to make it 3 0. Denmark could have won by much more, in fact. And Seth Piantic, uh, the Danish manager, when he was interviewed after the game, he actually bemoaned the chances they missed in this game, which he felt could have helped their goal difference. So, really, that wasn't saying much about the Irish performance when you have the opposition manager talking about. Or, or be more the fact that uh, Denmark weren't able to improve their goal difference in this game. Apparently, the only consolation... Now, there's only brief highlights of this on YouTube, so the YouTube highlights don't tell us an awful lot about the game itself as a whole, apart from the Danish goals. But the only consolation in this game, apparently, was the performance of Jim Bicklin, who, by all accounts, turned in a fine performance. But Mick McCarthy, you know, he was exposed in this game for a lack of pace. and his performance in this game suggested that he would be only backup for David O'Leary, Mark Lanson, and Kevin Moore. Now, following this defeat, Ireland were now in a weak qualifying position because you know, if they have won their opening, they had plus two on the spin, which meant they only had two points from their opening three qualifying matches. And some of media 
at this stage were already calling for Owen Hen's head. Okay, I, uh, someone Tim to Mer- to headquarters in Merion Square in Dublin to discuss the situation in front of the entire FAI committee. Hen said in his autobiography that although he was happy to stand his ground before the FAI, he said these meetings were not for the faint hearted because apparently these meetings consisted of the whole FAI committee and they tended to sit in a semicircle and you were as Owen Hand said, uh, you were in the middle of them. So he said in his autobiography, it felt as though that he was on trial, as it were. But after an end to anyway, Hand received the committee's support to continue. So, so it was back to uh, soccer once again. But it was kind of microcosm as well as to how quickly fortunes can change in soccer. Because just two months previously, Owen Hand was being hailed as a hero. And the Irish players themselves were hailed as heroes after the game against the Soviet Union. And now, two months later, there were calls for his dismissal, along with some harsh criticism of certain players for an alleged lack of commitment. And this alleged lack of commitment among, shall we say, particular players was a criticism that was often levelled at own hand during his tenure, and indeed the players themselves. And... I'll just now quote a little bit verbatim from Owen's autobiography because it is quite a good account of this. Now, I'll just now uh, read the following uh, couple of paragraphs because I think it sums it up quite well, uh, what, the, what the atmosphere was like in Irish international soccer coming towards the end of 1984. So Owen Hen says anyway, and I quote, After over four years in the job, I had no illusions about the media. When I had started as Ireland's manager, I had shown some naivety in my dealings with them. I felt that if I helped the press to do their job, they would help me to do mine. At the close of 1984, however, I knew better. It was obvious to me that a minority of journalists were bent on drumming up controversy, no matter what the cost to Irish football. If we lost games, all the better. That would supply even juicier headlines. Whatever about the infective aimed at me, it was the question of the player's loyalty to the cause that was hardest to accept. I knew how much it meant for these players to represent their country. Their desire was always beyond question. As for the suggestion that some of the players were somehow money grubbers, the reality was different. If getting rich quick was your game, you were in the wrong job playing for the Republic of Ireland. There was precious little financial gain associated with playing for this particular international side. The Irish players received a one-off £150 Irish punts match fee compared to the £1,000 sterling paid to English internationals. As well as that, the Irish players owned their lower profile of our game, lost out on the lucrative sponsorship deals enjoyed by their English counterparts. In fact, many Irish players could have earned more from personal appearances than they did while playing for their country. I know that in some cases, certain players, by joining up with us for midweek friendlies, actually missed out on £500 sterling appearance fees, which had been arranged by their agents. The players even paid for their own costs up front before being reimbursed by the FAI, and sometimes only after a very long wait. Unquote. So I think those paragraphs that I've quoted sums up the position and the atmosphere well in the Irish international setup at that time, uh, at the end of 1984. Ireland were very much seen as the correlations of international football. And as a result of that, there wasn't a lot of lucrative sponsorship deals or any of that available. So the association was really operating on a shoestring budget. And actually, nowhere will that become more evident then in the next game, which was a friendly against Italy in February of 1985, which I will discuss now in a couple of moments. I was going to ask Paul, we always talk about the English coverage of the Irish scene in our previous podcast. At this point, given Ireland's troubles, it looked like qualification was in doubt. What was the English coverage like? Television coverage would be non-existent, I would say. Oh, still non-existent. This campaign, yeah, yeah. Until we come to, obviously, the game against England, 
We may have seen the goal against the Soviet Union, but I don't think these games that we've just discussed would have would have featured at all. It, it was just almost completely outside. With English, so many English league something. players still. Yeah, it, it's yeah. strange. I don't know if there was you know some kind of different contractual arrangement that made it more difficult, but obviously it was. You know, Northern Ireland would feature more, but that was also maybe because they'd qualified for the 82 World Cup and would qualify for 86. But I really don't remember seeing almost any of these Republic games at all at this time. Yeah. As far as yourself, yeah. when it comes to press coverage, how did you keep up? Were you able to follow Ireland's matches? Um, they'd, they'd be in the papers and the, the football magazines. They, they, in fact, they'd cover them quite extensively because, as you say, there's a lot of, I mean, the, the majority of the team are playing for, for top English clubs. So um, they, they would be covered in that sense. It was just the television was just, for whatever reason, non-existent at that time. And then, Paul, maybe the fact that Ireland wasn't part of the United Kingdom, maybe, or the Republic, I should say, maybe that meant as well that they weren't really covered on British television. Yeah, I think that might have had something to do with it. Certainly, I don't know what the, as I say, the contracts were at that time. But unfortunately, it was like the rest of Europe. It wasn't. It wasn't shown in the uh, in the yeah. UK. Yeah, but fortunately, in recent years, you know, kind of some footage has been made available on YouTube because, for instance, uh, the entire game against the Soviet Union, uh, which was broadcast live in Ireland, is now on YouTube, and there's also extensive highlights of the game against Norway. Which, which was also shown on uh, Irish TV. Yeah, it's very fortunate that, that people, people including yeah. Sean, of and course, imagine, have uh, uh, posted and, these games for us to enjoy. And sorry for coming across you, Paul, but in actual fact, now I, I'll discuss this when we come to the England game, but when Ireland played England in that friendly in March of 85, the game wasn't shown live in England, but it was shown live in Ireland. So, I mean, to know it was a little, it was a bonus, shall we say, for our Irish viewers. Yeah, the, even the England games themselves were, especially the friendlies, I think the, the coverage was very erratic of those. There was there was nothing really in place to cover each game and some of the friendlies have slipped through the net completely. Yeah, I know, because because even though RTE, who are the Irish television service, even though they were kind of cash-strapped at the time, you know, kind of as well, like, you know, because we were in the 1980s and there was a recession going on. I mean, still the coverage of sport and indeed, you know, kind of association football was quite good because, I mean, they regularly showed English league matches. Uh, they showed English league matches, for instance, you know, during the 85-86 season when half of that season or the first half of that season was lost to English viewers uh, due to... Um, a television, or due to the fact that the ITP and BBC were at loggerheads with English FA over the um, televising of games and the televising of highlights. Yeah, that, that's right. It was a long period where there was there was nothing shown in uh, England at all. The, uh, the blackout at yeah. the start of that season. Exactly, yeah. and I mean, kind of even back in the eighties. I mean, the way England would play Scotland at the end of the year, kind of in the annual international. I mean, more often than not, those games were always shown on RT. Yeah, and that would be the one game yeah. that was almost always guaranteed to be on in, yes. in the UK as well. Yes, and I even remember as well, Paul, uh, in the lead up to Euro 88, even though I know now we're kind of jumping ahead for a moment, but in the lead up to that, even as he showed a couple of the England warm up games for us, uh, the game against Scotland in May, and then I think the following Saturday, they also played Switzerland in a friendly in, um, in Switzerland. So that game was televised live as well. So, I mean, RT, kind of for a small enough uh, television network, I mean, they were given reasonably good coverage. Yeah, that, that, that's good. I mean, but, but for some reason, yeah, yeah but, but for some reason, kind of the Denmark, the Ireland Denmark game from 84, for some reason on YouTube, there's only a couple of minutes highlights uh, on it, which basically had Denmark goals and little else. Yeah, it's hard to imagine myself and Sean end up discussing this most weeks, the lack of coverage, certainly in the UK, of international football. It's, it's impossible to imagine now that these games just weren't weren't shown at all. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, of course. And then and then for a long number of years as well, up to the mid-80s, RTE deals take their, um, do you know the broadcast of match of the day or the big match they'd actually use them, um, take that and broadcast it here. So viewers here in the Ireland got to see it, you know, those who might not have BBC or ITV. Okay, so we come to the new year, 
1985 and the number of friendlies. So first on February 5th at Dublin at Delhi Mount Park, Ireland took on defending World Cup champions, Italy. There's some controversy as far as the fact that the match was played at Delhi Mount Park and not at Lansdown Road. Uh, That's because, right, yes. mm. because 40,000 fans, more than 40,000 fans were expected for this match against the uh, defending World Cup champions. In fact, the game was delayed by 15 minutes to accommodate the extra crowd. For this, the FAI did not look good for not anticipating such a crowd. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, section of the crowd were allowed to get close to the touch lines. And this was also one more reason why Delhi Mount Park was not regarded as a future international yes. venue. Y- yes, Shahan. Well, before we get on to the actual game itself, I think, you know, kind of the, the offense, you know, kind of the off the field offense, shall we say, of that night, I think are worthy of, of discussion as well. Just to give a, a small background to it, despite the failure to qualify for Euro 1984, the then current world champions Italy was still a huge draw for the Irish soccer public. Now, due to the demands of Italian television, the match was played at a floodless Daily Mount Park. Because, as I said already, Lansdowne Road did not have floodlights until late 1993. Now, the game was covered live in Italy, but it wasn't covered live in Ireland. Going back to 1985, 1985 was a long time before UEFA licensing. And because of that, 40, in excess of 40,000 people crammed into Daily Mount, which had a maximum capacity at this time of 35,000 people. And even 35,000 was a stretch. You, you know, you really would be packing people in there to get 35,000 people in there. So in excess of 40,000 people turned up. Now, in the lead up to this game, the FAI had agreed a sponsorship deal with Steiger, who are a lager company. Steiger proceeded to run a huge promotional campaign, which saw the match being publicised in almost every pub in Dublin. And in addition to this, and this is a crucial point, for some reason, the game was not all ticket. So if the game had been all ticket, crowd control may have been, or may have prevailed, and 35,000 tickets could have been issued and there wouldn't have been a problem. Now, due to the overcrowding at the turnstiles, the game kicked off 15 minutes late. Jordan was virtually non-existent. And the Gardaí, or the Irish police force, claimed they had no choice but to just open up one entrance gate in order to avoid a crush. This inevitably caused a further crush in the stand and hundreds of supporters were forced to sit on any free space they could find along the side of the pitch. Now, in addition to all these overcrowding issues, a stylesman was attacked, and 1,500 pounds or Irish pounds, which roughly would be kind of the equivalent of sterling, uh, 1,500 pounds of gate money was stolen. And if that wasn't enough, both teams had to force their way through supporters to get to the dress rooms at half time. In the second half of this game, the match was delayed further when protesters invaded the pitch with a large banner denouncing brutality in Port Leisha Prison. Port Leisha Prison is a maximum security prison here in Port Leisha, which is in County Leash in the Republic of Ireland. And at this time, it was housing a lot of prisoners who were convicted of uh, terrorism, particularly terrorist offences in the north of Ireland. So there was allegations of brutality going on in the prison at this time. So that culminated in a group of protesters invading the Daily Mount Park pitch to protest against this brutality in Port Leisha prison. Now, Italian TV were also unhappy because the match, as I mentioned, it was live in Italy, but not in Ireland. And because of that, most of the advertising hoarding, which was directed at the Italian market and which would have been bought by Italian firms and in the lead up to uh, this game, the advertising hoardings anyway could not be seen due to the hoardings being obstructed 
by the supporters who were sitting on the perimeter of the pitch. So that really was, so I mean, it was quite a build up, like kind of the off the field activities certainly were, maybe in some ways were, are still talked about to this day. And um, it really held at the end of Daily Mount Park as an international venue because it was clear from then on that Daily Mount Park was no longer equipped to hold international matches. Certainly, international matches where you had one of the major powers of soccer playing there. Now, there was a couple of internationals played in Daily Mount Park in later years, if I recall. Uh, there was a match in November of 87 against Israel, which was a friendly. That was played there. And there was the game in February of 1989, another friendly against France. And that was played there as well. But the last international that was played there was actually in September of 1990. It was the Republic's first match after Italian 90, and it was a friendly that September against Morocco. So really, kind of, the few internationals that were played at Daily Mount Park after 1985, they were kind of the, the opposition, maybe with the exception of France, the opposition, you know, to be great crowd pullers. So, I mean, as regards major competitive games, Daily Mount Park was out for running, but it was used on a couple of occasions up to 1990, and then it kind of seized as an international venue. So that was Daily Mount Park anyway. You can just imagine now, the whole of this game is available on YouTube. It was the, the footage that was broadcast in Italy. And uh, it is quite a sight because, I mean, as I've already described, you have footage of supporters on the sideline and advertising hoardings are obscured with supporters and so on. But fortunately enough, the Irish supporters, well, first of all, it, it was all, you could say, uh, it was a completely Irish support because Italy had little or no supporters with them. And fortunately, the Irish supporters over the years and even today, they have a reputation of being very well behaved. So even though they were sitting kind of on the touch lines and they were on the perimeter of the pitch, you know, there was no instances of crowd trouble or crowd disorder or anything like that. Because I can only just imagine, you know, kind of if a similar situation occurred in England, would the match have been able to proceed at all? Because unfortunately, with uh, so many supporters, you kind of, I've no doubt that writing would have been sued. Yeah. But fortunately, anyway, as I said, the, the Republic of Ireland supporters, you know, they have gained a good reputation over the years for being well behaved. So kind of obviously the, the police, uh, when they were shepherded them onto the perimeter of the pitch, they were obviously told, you know, to sit down and um, not obstruct the play as best they could. And uh, they done that. But at one stage anyway, in the second half, Paolo Rossi went over to take a corner. And he actually had to plead with the supporters to uh, actually move back, you know, to give him room to run up and you know run up to the ball and uh, take the corner. So, so that anyway was the was kind of the shall we say the side plot to the game itself. But to, to go on to the game itself, no, Shahan, would you like to run through yes. the teams? Packy Bonner back in the lineup from Celtic. This must have been his first match. Maybe in the, I don't. Know, did he play the previous season? I don't recall. He may have. Maybe uh, a friend. Yeah, he played. Yeah, he played in November of '83 against Malta in the East. Oh, so it'd been a, it'd been some time since he was in the squad. So he was yeah. back in the lineup. Chris Hutton of Tottenham, Jim Beglin, Liverpool, Mark Lawrenson of Liverpool. Interestingly, he'd be injured in the fifth minute when he tackled Altobelli in the box, which led to a penalty kick. And after a few minutes, he'd be replaced in the ninth minute by international debutant Paul McGrath of Man United. You have Mick McCarthy of Man City, Liam Brady of Inter in Italy, playing against some of his teammates, Kevin Shiddy of Everton, Gary Waddock of Queen's Park Rangers, Tony Galvin of Tottenham, he replaced by Ronnie Whelan in the 29th minute. Frank Stapleton, captain the side of Man United. John Frederick Byrne, international debutant from Queen's Park Rangers. And he be replaced by another debutant, Alan Campbell of Spanish side Racing Santander in the 76th minute. And quickly going through the Italy side, you have Franco Tancredi of Roma, Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Antonio Cabrini of Juventus, Pietro Viercovod of Sampdoria, Gaetano Shirea of Juventus, Salvator Bagni of Napoli, Bruno Conti of Roma, he replaced by Giuseppe Dosena of Torino in the 72nd minute, capping the side Marco Tardelli of Juventus, Paolo Rossi of Juventus, he replaced by Aldo Serena 
of Torino in the 72nd minute, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, and Alessandro Altobelli of Inter in the side managed by Enzo Bierzot. So we mentioned Mark Lawrenson's foul that led to the penalty kick in the fifth minute that was scored by Paolo Rossi. In the 18th minute, Altobelli doubled the lead. And Ireland would pull a goal back in the second half in the 53rd minute through Gary Wadak. But all in all, it was the events off the field that overshadowed anything on it. Yeah, he, he, yeah, that's absolutely right, Shahan. First of all, just, just a couple of points about the team selection. Now, Clanson, that, as you mentioned, went off after five minutes. This was actually his top tiered cap for the Republic. He injured himself, actually, as you say, when, when he fouled out to Billy for the penalty, which was actually, it was something of a reckless foul. And, of course, Paolo Rossi didn't score from the spot. Now, he injured himself, as you mentioned, in the process, and he was replaced in by Paul McGrath. This was Paul McGrath's debut, and by all accounts, anyway, he used class in the game. Kind of, he, he had a very smooth uh, international debut. It proved to on hand, and everybody who watched the game that he was a player who was able to hold his own and be comfortable with the demands of international football. But an interesting story about Paul McGrath is that, as you know, this was his debut for Ireland. It was actually also the first time he was called up to the Republic of Ireland squad. So, of course, Paul, in his naivety at the time, he didn't understand the concept of teams meeting up in the team hotel maybe a couple of days before the game or maybe the day before the game or whatever. So the night before the Italian game, Paul McGrath actually spent the night, he overnighted at his mother's house in Crumlin, which is a suburb of Dublin. And he said afterwards, he said, in his naivety, he thought, why waste a hotel bed? when his mum lived relatively close by to Daily Mount Park. So on hand anyway for the finish had to explain to him the next morning the whole principle of team getting together and bonding as a unit. But as Frank Stapleton said at the time, when, when on hand actually um, asked Frank Stapleton, was Paul McGrath like this at Manchester United? And Frank's reply to one apparently was that, yeah, Paul is um, quite a laid back individual about things like this. So, <laughs> so that was a, that was an interesting actually a side note at this game. So, as I say, after five minutes, anyway, Italy went ahead with the Paul Rossi penalty, and after eighteen minutes, then Alto Belli held off Paul McGrath in the box and scored following a loss of possession by Houston. The ball subsequently played into Alto Belli, and he done the necessary. But after fifty-three minutes, then eight minutes into the second half, a bright moment for the Republic was when. Frank Stapleton ran into the box and played the ball back to Waddock, who scored from 18 yards into the corner. Now, as I was saying, the whole of this game is available on YouTube. And for anybody who kind of wants to see organised chaos, suddenly from, you know, an off-the-field point of view, uh, it's, <laughs> it's good viewing. So, yeah, so that was that. So even though it was this was Ireland's third straight defeat, but nevertheless, I mean, it was a good walkout and a reasonably good performance against Italy, who were the Dane World Champions. So Ireland's next game then was another friendly at the end of February, on the 27th of February of 1985 against Israel. At Tel and, Aviv. And yes, let's, we should right. mention the previous year, they lost heavily. I think they lost 3-0, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, yes. Right. Mm, mm, yeah. And for some reason, Shahan, and I don't know why, but maybe it was obviously an agreement that was done between the Israel FA and the FAI, was that, as you mentioned, Israel played Ireland the previous year in Israel in a friendly. But usually, kind of for friendlies, there tends to be a home and away agreement. So Ireland playing Israel the following year, you would wonder why the game wasn't in Dublin. But for whatever reason, anyway, the game was once again in Tel Aviv. For this match, Packy Bonner was back in a goal again. Chris Hewton of Tottenham, David O'Leary of Arsenal, Mick McCarthy of Man City, Jim Beglin of Liverpool. Because Ireland had enough center backs, Paul McGrath was shifted to midfield. Paul McGrath of Man United. So Sorry. you have Paul McGrath, Ronnie Whelan of Liverpool. Gary Waddock of Queen's Park Rangers, Kevin Sheedy of Everton, Frank Stapleton, capping the side Man United. He replaced by John Byrne of Queen's Park Rangers in the 65th minute and Alan Campbell of Racing Santander in Spain. So mm. scoreless match. 
I'm not sure if there's footage of this match as well. No, 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 there's, there's, actually, there's actually no footage whatsoever of this game. And indeed, Shahan, there's no reports of the game either. So we can really only we can really only draw our own conclusions, I'm afraid. Yes. Well, the scoreless score, I guess, gives a lot away. So next we come to March 26th, the aforementioned match against England at Wembley. And we've discussed this match in our England podcast as well. What really stands out, this was Gary Lineker's first goal for England. This match at Wembley, relatively low crowd of just under 35,000. So Ireland had Packy Bonner of Celtic in goal, Chris Hewton of Tottenham, Mick McCarthy, Man City. I, I, actually, sorry, sorry, Shahan, I, I lost you totally there for a moment. Oh, but um, if, I can, uh, if I can just go back quickly to that Israel game and just maybe from the, from an Israel point of view, the Israel team, they were a team at the time, they were picked entirely from their own domestic league, but there was a there was three players actually in the lineup that were prominent and or came to prominence in eight years. Avi Cohen, yes, who actually Liverpool. Played, and later played for uh, Glasgow Rangers. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Ronnie, yeah, Ronnie Rosenthal, who was actually playing in the Israeli league at this time, but of course he later played for Liverpool as well. And also a guy, um, Eli O'Hanna, who, who oh, played... Oh, yes, of Mechelen. Of Mechelen there. in Belgium. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. in fact, he, you know, so. yeah, he was a Cup Winners' Cup winner in 1988 with Mechelen. That's right, yes. Mm, that's right. Going back to this England match, Paddy Bonner in goal, Celtic, Chris Hewton, Tottenham, Mick McCarthy, Man City, Mark Larson, Liverpool, Jim Beglin, Liverpool, Paul McGrath, Man United, he replaced by David O'Leary in the 46th minute, Gary Waddock, Queen's Park Rangers, Liam Brady, Inter in Italy, Ronnie Whelan of Liverpool, he replaced by Kevin O'Callaghan. At this point, he was at Portsmouth in the 70th minute, Frank Stapleton, captain of the side, Man United, Eamon O'Keefe of Portwell. This was his fifth and final cap. His first cap was in 1981. And he'd be replaced by John Byrne of Queen's Park Rangers in the 79th minute. Quickly, the English lineup, we have Gary Bailey of Manchester United in goal, Viv Anderson of Arsenal, Kenny Sansom of Arsenal, Mark Wright of Southampton, Terry Butcher of Ipswich, Trevor Stephen of Everton, capping the side Brian Robson of Manchester United, he was replaced by Glenn Hoddle of Tottenham in the 67th minute. Ray Wilkins of AC Milan in Italy. Chris Waddle of Newcastle. Mark Haitley of AC Milan in Italy. He was replaced by Peter Davenport of Nottingham Forest in the 73rd minute. And Gary Lineker of Leicester, the side managed by Bobby Robson. Trevor Stephen in the 44th minute. And Gary Lineker would score his first goal for England in the 76th minute. And Liam Brady would pull a goal back in the 87th minute. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, just a couple of takeaways from this game, uh, Shahan. First of all, an attendance of uh, 34,793, which kind of for a midweek night was at Wimbley was a reasonable enough attendance, I guess. Almost 35,000 people. Liam Brady, uh, this was actually his 50th camp. For Ireland, and as you mean, Eamon O'Keefe, this was his fifth and final appearance for the Republic. Kevin O'Callaghan, who came on after 70 minutes for Ronnie Whelan, he was actually now with Portsmouth. He had left Ipswich and was now with Portsmouth. England were a very good team at the time, and they had made an excellent start to their own qualifying campaign for the 86 World Cup. So just to run down the goals once again, just before half time, 44 minutes, Terry Butcher crossed into the box, Mark Haitley flicked it on, it deflected off wheeling into Trevor Stevens' pet, and he scored from six yards. After 75 minutes, Alan Ball hit the top of McCarthy's head and ran into the pet of Peter Davenport, who passed it on to the incoming Gary Lineker, who scored with his left foot over Pat Bonner. And this, of course, was Gary's first international goal. And after 87 minutes then, uh, a series of one-twos between Stapleton and Brady ended with Brady, who was playing his 50th international, scoring from six yards under Gary Bailey from Gary Bailey's lift. But a reasonably good performance all round. But once again, the preparation of this game from an Irish point of view left a lot to be desired because on hand has written that the preparations for this game were, were shambolic. To make an answer short anyway, rather than being booked into a hotel in the lead-up to this game, 
they were booked into an economy travel lodge. And while they were there, there was construction work going on there. Owen Hand apparently spoke to Ted Croker, who was the Secretary of the English FA at the time, as to why the Irish weren't booked into a better accommodation. And Ted Croker informed him that an FAI official had been in touch with him and the FAI official requested cheaper lodgings for the team in return for a larger match fee. So unfortunately, once again, you know, kind of the penny pinching atmosphere that pervaded within the FAI was very much evident once again here in that in exchange for a larger match fee, the team itself had to suffer as a result of kind of true less salubrious accommodation in the lead up to this game. And in actual fact, the travel lodge that they were booked into, they actually did not have enough rooms for everyone. So to make a long story short, Terry Conroy, who was Owen Hen's assistant, he was the Ireland assistant manager at this time, he had no option because he had no room reserved for him in the hotel. So he had no option but just take his bag and get accommodation in the next available hotel. So, yeah, so, I mean, unfortunately, you know, kind of it did not reflect once again on the FAI, but, and, you know, Shahan kind of, and, um, you know, several players prior to this time have touched on this. Maybe this kind of contributed as well on occasions to players not making themselves available to play for the Republic. You You can tell Jackie Charlton would not have stood for something like this. No, no. And of course, I mean, as we all know, but kind of what it then, unfortunately, as we know, it continued on. Maybe not so much through the Charlton era, but certainly kind of maybe through the McCarthy era as well. The Mick McCarthy era as manager, it pervaded. And of course, it came to, um, it came to uh, as we all know, an unceremonial blow up in Saipan in 2002 between Mick McCarthy and Roy Keane. But as I say, I mean, kind of, it did not reflect well on the FAI because, I mean, kind of they were perceived by many. And it was easy to see why it has just been out to make a fast book and a penny pinching organisation. Owen Hand says in his book that um, around this time he spoke to Frank Stapleton, who, of course, was with Manchester United. And Frank said to him that any time Manchester United played in London, they always stayed at the upmarket Lancaster Hotel. So, I mean, kind of if Roy Keane had been around in 1985, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what he, anyway, for Stapleton would have made of uh, this. But uh, there you go. After these uh, three friendly matches, you're back to the qualifiers. Yes, that's the right. End of the mm. season on May first at Dublin's Lansdowne Road, Ireland took on Norway. Again, this should have been a match for the taking for the Irish. So many things to take away from this match. First of all, let's go through the lineups. Ireland started with. Paddy Bonner in goal, Celtic Glasgow. David Langan back in the squad from Oxford United. He'd replaced by Paul McGrath in the 83rd minute. And, I, and actually, sorry, Shahan, if I can just come in there. Uh, Dave Langan of Oxford United, this was his 16th cap. But this was his first appearance for Ireland since the game against France in October of 1981. So yes. he had been out of the international scene for quite a while. Yes, his international mm. career in general was very sporadic, even into the yes. Jackie Charlton era. So mm. in the center of defense, you have Mark Larson, Liverpool, and David O'Leary of Arsenal, Jim Beglin of Liverpool, Jerry Daly of Birmingham City, Liam Brady of Inter. He'd be replaced by Ronnie Villan in the 67th minute. In fact, Brady received a medal before the kickoff in recognition of his 50th cap. So you have Gary Waddock of Queen's Park Rangers, Tony Galvin of Tottenham, Frank Stapleton, captain beside Manchester United, and Michael Robinson back in the squad. At this point, he had joined Queen's Park Rangers. Again, as far as the Norway side, you have the familiar faces of Eric Thorsved, Ag Harade, and Halvar Torsen, and <laughs> Oakland. This match ended as a scoreless tie. And we also should point out that Stapleton had a goal that was disallowed. And Ireland were missing Hewton and Sheedy. And incidentally, I'm not sure if this is the only time, but they wore those yellow hoop shirts for this match. Was this the only time they wore those shirts? Do you know? Is that the, the yellow hoop shirt, shall we say, going down the, from the shoulder, is it? 
I believe so. Yeah, it's like uh, I'm not sure if it's a collectible item, but uh, I'm not sure if they wore it too many times. Yes. Yeah. And some critics believe that some of the Liverpool contingent had the Champions Cup in their mind at the end of the month. Some Manchester United players had the FA Cup final in their mind that was coming up. And Brady had a poor match and he was substituted. And this was considered very controversial at the time. And after the match, Owen Hand and the players were booed. And Hand described this match as perhaps the worst display of any Irish team I had managed. And in fact, he after the match in the dressing room, he told the players that he was going to resign. And as uh, according to him, he could not give him any direction. But Liam Brady and some of the other players urged him to stay with a show of hands. Also, McGrath had publicly disliked his midfield role and was dropped from the starting lineup in place of Wadak. And McGrath's displeasure had reached Owen's hands ears somehow. That's one more story about this match. Yes. But uh, the writing was on the wall. I mean, just six months right. ahead. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, kind of, first of all, Shahan, you know, kind of a game that was in Ensign Road, only 15,000 people turned up. So maybe that, maybe a lot of supporters maybe had, you know, given up the ghost at this stage as well on the chances of the Republic fan qualifying. Anyway, by all accounts, anyway, this game, now again, does little, no, I don't think there's any footage of this on YouTube. Kind of, it's hard really for, unless maybe you were at the game. And, um, you know, it's kind of hard to maybe make a definitive assessment of the performance. But by all accounts, anyway, uh, this was the worst competitive performance under Owen Hen's reign because it was one of those games where nothing appeared to come off. Apparently, with the exception of Pat Bonner, who had a fine game in goal, all the outfield players performed quite poorly. Norway uh, played with a packed defence and they choked the game. And... Ireland, for some reason, just couldn't find the inventiveness to break them down. And uh, indeed, Frank Stapleton had a goal disallowed for a marginal offside against Michael Robinson. And Owen Hand said that it was kind of a symptom of the, of the performance in that you, virtually nobody from the Irish side protested too much about Stapleton's goal being disallowed for the marginal offside call. Liam Brady, as you mentioned, he had a very poor game and he was substituted by Ronnie Whelan. And now, because of this nil nil draw, they had dropped three points to Norway. Norway, in actual fact, Norway were only to win one qualifying match in this group, and that was the match against Ireland the previous um, October in Oslo. So Ireland had dropped three points to Norway, and as a result, they were now in serious trouble. And in a particularly unsavoury episode, at the final whistle, a number of fans turned on the team and the team management at the final whistle. And as you mentioned, uh, Shahan on hand offered to resign at that stage, but the players urged him to stay on. And going back to Liam Brady for a moment, as we alluded to, uh, this was one of his poor performances. But maybe one of the reasons why his display was so poor was that for some time before this, he had been tapped by some fans for what they perceived to be ineffective displays. And by all accounts, apparently, he tried too hard in this game as a result. But unfortunately, this had the opposite effect in that it culminated in one of his worst performances for the Republic. Now, sadly, however, and this is not in keeping, I have to say, with Irish soccer support as a whole, but Lolly McMenemy, who was then the Southampton manager, he attended the game. And after the game, he left the ground with one hand. But as Laurie and Owen Hand were leaving the ground, some fans verbally attacked both of them. Laurie McMenemy was targeted because he was English. And some of the Irish team were actually spat upon as they made their way to the team bus. But that will just give you kind of an idea as to how the fortunes of soccer can change in seven or eight months. Because from the high of the previous September, when they beat the Soviet Union to come down to a um, huge anticlimax in this game against Norway. Now, Sean Ryan, I know you probably have this publication, he has written a book called The Boys in Green, DFI International Story from 1921 to 1997. 
And if I can just quote um, a paragraph from uh, Sean Ryan's book, because maybe this could explain why the Irish performance on the day was so poor. He said that, um, and I quote, that such a star-studded Irish team should perform so poorly may have had something to do with the timing of the game because the game came in the middle of a period of top quality club games. Brady had just suffered the agony of losing out in extra time in the semi-final of the UEFA Cup with Inter Milan. Manchester United's uh, Stapleton, McGrath and Moran had an FA Cup final date in 10 days' time, while the Liverpool contingent of Bakelin, Lawrenson and, and Whelan had a date with destiny at the Heysel Stadium for the European Cup final. And although Kevin Sheedy, as we know, wasn't involved in this game, he was preparing for the Cup Winners Cup final with Everton. Whereas, on the other hand, the Norwegians had no such distractions. So, as I say, on hand anyway, a volunteer to uh, step down after display, but players actually persuaded him to stay on. Now, even though this wasn't evident at the time, in retrospect, Sean Ryan says that this proved to be a crucial decision because apparently if Owen Hand had resigned at this juncture, it is likely that Bob Paisley, who was the recently retired Liverpool manager, would have been chosen to replace him because at this stage, Jack Charlton was not available. Jack Charlton was still in club management at this time. So had Owen Hand resigned, there is a strong possibility that Bob Paisley could have taken over, which would have meant, of course, that maybe Jack Charlton may never have uh, taken the helm with the Republic of Ireland. But yeah. again, I mean, this is just conjecture. Paul, do you remember these rumours with Bob Paisley? No, I've not heard that one um, before. It would have been an interesting appointment at that time. I think Jack Charlton was still at Newcastle, I think, at this point. So... Yeah, he, he wouldn't have been available, but it would have been a, an interesting choice for Bob Paisley yeah. to be managing, yeah. certainly. Yeah, and I mean, now, now I know we're, we're, we're jumping the gun a little bit and, and we'll d- deal with this in more depth in the next podcast, but just to quickly mention, I mean, when Jack Charlton was appointed in February of 1986, as you know, I mean, Bob Paisley was kind of the preferred choice, but Bob Paisley got more votes. But the reason why Bob Paisley wasn't appointed was that Bob Paisley had not officially or formally applied for the position of the Republic of Ireland manager's job. So it was suggested in by somebody on the FAI committee that it wasn't quite right to appoint somebody who hadn't applied for the position. So as a result of that, a number of other votes were taken and Jack Charlton subsequently got the nod. Yeah, helped by the fact as well, I should say, that uh, by the time the final decisive vote came, one delegate who had backed Bob Paisley up to then for some reason changed his mind. Yeah, like you said, this is yeah. kind of like next well, times. But yeah, it went through a few rounds, the voting, guy, if I seem to remember. It was on like one one ballot, and then I think it went a few couple of times. But anyway, that's for next hmm. time. But sorry, Shahan, but just, just to kind of round up in this Norway game, Owen Han says in his book that um, a few hours after the Norway game, he discussed with Liam Brady the decision to substitute him. And Liam took it in a totally professional manager, or, or manner, I should say making it clear that he understood. Now, Owen also says this, although, and I quote, although many of the players were disparaged at various times during my tenure, I believe that Liam Brady and Frank Stapleton came in for especially unfair attention. With their dedication to the cause, sometimes publicly questioned, both players felt under a lot of pressure. Liam's below power performance in the home match against Norway was a case in point. There were repeated attacks in the media, casting doubt on his passion for playing for his country, and he went out to prove a point. The outcome was one of his worst games for the Republic of Ireland. It was a tough decision to make to substitute Liam. He was also, at this stage of the game, being targeted by pockets of the crowd. Nobody likes being substituted, and even less so when the occasion is international football and you are playing in front of a home crowd. Now, Owen did say that the one plus for us at this stage, at this point in the campaign, was that the Soviet Union had not yet found our farm. In other words, they had lost to Ireland and they also had drawn two other matches. So at this stage, there was still a point behind the Republic. Allied to this was the fact that I, 
you know, their own hand, believed two winnable games awaited us at home and away to Switzerland. Before the final qualifier of the season uh, with Switzerland in June, there was one more friendly on May 26th. This was at Cork's Flower Lodge. Now, this was the first international match in Cork in 46 years. So yes. This, we're talking like pre-war. For this match, Seamus McDonough was back in goal from Notts County. And, and uh, this was against Spain, we should mention. Yes, so yes. David Langan of Oxford United, he replaced by Patrick Byrne of Shamrock Rovers in the 81st minute. David O'Leary, Arsenal. Mick McCarthy, Man City. Chris Hutton of Tottenham. He replaced by Kieran O'Regan of Brighton in the 65th minute. This was O'Regan's fourth and final cap. His first cap was in 1983. Yeah. Jerry Daly of Birmingham City. Gary Waddock of Queen's Park Rangers. Liam Brady capping the side this time from Inter in Italy. Tony Galvin of Tottenham. He'd be replaced by Tony Grealish of West Bromwich Albion in the 25th minute. I have to assume it must have been an injury if it's that early. Alan Campbell of Racing Santander playing his third and final match for Ireland, all of them in 1985. And Michael Robinson of Queen's Park Rangers. The Spanish lineup, we have Andoni Zubizarreta of Bilbao, Gerardo of Barcelona, Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón, Andoni Goicochea of Bilbao, Jose Camacho of Real Madrid, Victor of Barcelona, Ricardo Gallego of Real Madrid, he replaced by Ramon Caldere of Barcelona. Rafael Gordillo of Betis. He replaced by Julio Alberto of Barcelona in the 76th minute. Marcos Alonso. Every time we mention father of current Chelsea player of Bar- this is of Barcelona. He replaced by Roberto Marina of Atletico Madrid. Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid. He be replaced by Manuel Sarabia of Bilbao in the 85th minute and Hippolito Rincon of Betis and the side manager by Miguel Munoz. The scoreless match. And I don't know if there's footage of this match as well. No, there's yeah. actually no match footage whatsoever. No match footage. Right. Mm. Yeah. Now, just maybe a couple of quick points, first of all. First of all, maybe a quick word about the venue itself. It was played, as you mentioned, in Cork, in a stadium called Flower Lodge. Now, Flower Lodge was the home of uh, Cork Hibernians and later Cork Alberts, who were uh, League of Ireland soccer teams in the 1960s and 1970s. After 1985, well, actually, the present League of Ireland t- soccer team in Cork, uh, Cork City, uh, they were formed in 1984. And they played their matches at another soccer ground in Cock called Turner's Cross. So as a result, uh, Flower Lodge kind of went into... Uh, Flower Lodge, anyway, was in this useful number of years. And um, it's still there today as a Gaelic Games stadium. Uh, do you know Gaelic Games? Uh, Hurling and Gaelic football, which would be the Irish national sports. Uh, it was purchased by the Gaelic Athletic Association about um, 20 years ago or so, because it was no longer in use as a soccer venue. And it was getting quite dilapidated at this stage. So uh, the ground is still used, but it is no longer used uh, for soccer. So moving on to the Spanish team then. Yeah, by all accounts, by looking, reading down the line up there that you mentioned, uh, it's quite a strong Spanish team. So maybe for the Republic to get a nil-nil draw was a reasonable result. But then you have to remember as well that Spain were going through something of a sticky patch at this time as well because in the few months previous uh, to this game uh, they had lost two World Cup qualifying games themselves, they had lost to Scotland and they had also lost to Wales so although Spain were to ultimately qualify for the 86 World Cup as group winners ahead of Scotland and Wales they had lost to both Scotland and Wales so you could say that maybe the Spanish team were going through something of a sticky spell at that particular period. Just anyway, just to go back to the, the Irish team for a couple of moments, Shahan, Jim McDonough, the goalkeeper, he was now with Gillingham. And in Campbell, as you mentioned, this was his third and final cap. And of course, Keanu O'Regan, who came on 
as a substitute for Chris Houston. This was his fourth and final cap. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, there was no Liverpool player selected because the European Cup final in the Heysel Stadium was on the following Wednesday, which was three days later. So needless to say, there was no Liverpool player selected. Manchester United had just won the FA Cup, so there was no Manu player selected. And of course, Kevin Sheedy had just come off, I suppose, an arduous season with Everton, you know, winning the league, winning the Cup Winners' Cup, and then losing the FA Cup final to Manchester United. So he wasn't selected either. So in many ways, it was an Irish team without, say, Liverpool, Manchester United and Everton players. So experimental, now, yeah. Yes, yes. So you could say maybe, even though in the absence of match footage, it's impossible to um, say it, say it definitively. But kind of looking at the two lineups on paper, you could say that maybe a nil-nil draw was was a reasonable result. Now, Owen Hand states in his autobiography that after this game against Spain, he was made aware of a failed attempt within DFAI to oust him as manager in the lead up to this game. Because, by all accounts, an FAI delegate had led an unsuccessful coup against Owen Hand. Because he was the delegate was apparently hoping to get a bigger gate or a bumper gate for this international game by having the publicity of a new manager installed in time for this game. So, again, that's another story or an anecdote in Owen Hen's autobiography. Who did it have lined up? Well, it, that, that's not clear, but may, possibly Bob Paisley. Mm. Because, you know, kind of Bob Paisley was kind of currying a lot of favour among the higher ranks of the FAI at this time. And he was also available because he had to retire as manager of Liverpool. And indeed, the following year, actually, Des Casey, who was the FAI president, actually approached Bob Paisley directly, visited him in person, and had kind of uh, talked him into agreeing to take the manager's position. So we come to the end of the season. The last qualifier for the season on June 2nd at Dublin's uh, Lansdowne Route, with Ireland taking on Switzerland. Now, for this match, you have Seamus McDonough back in goal. You said at this point he was not nuts counting player, but he had been loaned to Gillingham, I believe, Yes, that's right. right. That's okay. right, yeah. Then you have David Langan of Oxford United, David O'Leary, Arsenal, Mick McCarthy, Manchester City, Jim Beglin, Liverpool, Jerry Daly, Birmingham City. He be replaced by Ronnie Whelan in the 46th minute. Tony Grealish of West Bromwich Albion. He be replaced by Paul McGrath of Manchester United in the 63rd minute. Liam Brady of Inter, Kevin Sheedy of Everton, Frank Stapleton, captain the side from Manchester United, and Michael Robinson of Queen's Park Rangers. And quickly going through the Switzerland lineup, you have Carl Engel of Neuchâtel Zamax. He'll be replaced by Eric Burgener of Servet in the 23rd minute, so must have been an injury. Alan Geiger of Servet. Heinz Ludi of FC Zurich, Roger Verley of Grasshopper, Charles in Alban of Grasshopper, Andre Egli of Borussia Dortmund in West Germany, Umberto Barberis of Servet, he replaced by George Bregi of Young Boys Bern in the 59th minute, Heinz Hermann of Grasshopper, Michel de Castel of Servet, Christian Mate of La Chaux de Fonds and Manfred Braskler of St. Gallen, side manager by Paul Wolfisberg. So, this match, Ireland would win 3 0. Frank Stapleton would start the scoring in the eighth minute. Tony Grulish would score the second and 33rd minute. And Kevin Sheedy would round out the scoring in the 57th minute. So, at least they ended the season on a positive note. But even yes. with the win, qualification looked bleak. Yeah, yeah. And against Shahan, uh, this game, it was played in Lansdowne Road on a Sunday afternoon, a balmy Sunday afternoon, in fact. And But unfortunately, once again, a crowd of just 17,300 uh, people were present. So as I mentioned, like with the poor attendance in the Norway game, maybe a lot of people had given up the ghost of the Republic qualifying at this stage for Mexico 86. But 
as you mentioned, Shahan, it was a good all round performance. In, in many ways, I suppose it was the best performance of the qualifying campaign, along, of course, with the victory of the Soviet Union. And of course, what was notable as well was that uh, the previous Wednesday, they, of course, you know, the tragedy in Heisel took place. So great credit was due to the Liverpool contingent of players for making themselves available to play uh, the following Sunday because I'm sure it wasn't easy for them coming off the back of a tragedy such as the Heysel Stadium disaster. Sir uh, John, uh, do you think the low turnout maybe had to do something with that as well? I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I really don't know, because you see, kind of, in Ireland, there was never really any history as such of crowd problems or crowd disturbances as soccer matches. Now, there would have been a few isolated instances maybe at League of Ireland games, there was one incident actually at a UEFA Cup game in Daly Park in 1984 when Bohemian Dublin played Glasgow Rangers. And apparently at the friction in that game, I suppose it was really, you know, caused by both sides. But for the most part, there wasn't a history or a record of crowd disturbances at soccer games. So I would say, Shahan, that the low turnout was down to the fact that a lot of people, like in the game against Norway, a lot of people, you know, had given up on the Republic qualifying for Mexico 86. But anyway, but just anyway, to um to go back to just a, a few takeaways from this game, Shahan, Tony Grealish and Kevin Cheedy, they returned to the midfield in place of Gary Waddock and Tony Galvin. And Grealish and Cheedy, they added work rate, skill and clinical finishing to the midfield department. And after seven minutes, Kevin Cheedy, he sent a free over to the Switzerland back post where Dave Langen crossed first time on the volley for an in Russian Stapleton to score from close range. After 33 minutes, Tony Grealish broke from deep and he slipped through the Swiss man marking and scored with a lovely flicked header off the post. And after 57 minutes, Kevin Sheedy rounded off the scoring when he ran onto a long pass and coolly slotted home. Now, the entire game is available on YouTube and it was uh, one of the better Republic of Ireland performances in this era. And I actually saw the game myself a while back and another notable performance was actually the performance of Jim Bakelin. He really played quite well in this game because he was constantly going forward and offering Ireland an attacking outlet. He was going forward all the time and sending over crosses and so on and, and making breaks from deep. So, all in all, anyway, this was a comfortable victory for the Republic and it was an all-on good performance. But it seems what could have been a major factor in this performance being so good was that the majority of the squad had been together for 10 days before the game. And this was a luxury that Owen Hand seldom had during his time as Ireland manager. So because they were together for 10 days before the game, Owen Hand was able to uh, give him a lot of quality time, as it were, in preparing for the game and, you know, working on training and set pieces and so on, and tactics. So Ireland actually topped the table after this game, even though they were only top for a couple of days because the following Wednesday, Denmark played the Soviet Union in Denmark. But this win anyway took some of the pressure off one hand for a little while anyway, as generally over the summer months of 1985, until competitive action resumed the following September again. So all in all, hand, kind of for a non-tournament year, kind of it was notable that they played 10 international matches kind of with varying degrees of success or maybe, or, although I suppose maybe more often failure than success. But there was a couple of high points in that season, uh, namely the win against the USSR, uh, the win against Switzerland, and of course even the two friendly defeats against Italy and England. Because although these friendlies ended in defeats, uh, the performances in both games was quite encouraging. And of course there were a few new players on it as well, players such as uh, Paul McGrath and John Bourne, for instance. My takeaway is that obviously because I'm able to with hindsight, I can see what's going to happen next. But yes. nevertheless, it didn't look like Ireland had much chance of qualifying. Certainly, yeah, there were some introductions like McGrath and players as such. But as a whole, you could not see Ireland dislodge either the Soviets or Denmark from qualifying. It's no great shame to have been eliminated by those two teams. However, the fact yes. that they didn't even give it a fight is more concerning, probably for the Irish yeah. fans. Yeah, yeah. And, and particularly kind of dropping three points to Norway, which yes, of course, in yes. those days, as you know, it was two points for a win. 
kind of uh, whatever about losing to Denmark away, could nearly live with that. And uh, I suppose maybe losing to the Soviets in Moscow, which, which we'll see in the next podcast, but losing to Norway away and then only drawn with him at home, not being able to score actually in the two matches against him was for a team that was perceived to have several quality players uh, almost unforgivable. Again, it's kind of a shame when you see like someone, Liam Brady, when Jackie Charlton came to prominence, Liam Brady was like in the tail end of his career. You kind of wish yeah. if had he been in his prime, how things would have been different for him. Yes, yes. And then, of course, as well, you see Jack Charlton wanted Liam Brady to play kind of in a different way, which was kind of at variance with Liam Brady's natural talents. And, of course, that caused friction between the two of them. And in actual fact, you know, it kind of culminated in Liam Brady being uh, infamously uh, substituted in a game against the West Germans in 1989. But, of course, uh, all that is in the future. Jim Beglin probably stood out as, as a defender. And we said McGrath. As yeah. a hope for future, now she now, as well, maybe. Now, on hand too, actually, around the time of the Norway game, Ray Houghton, who, who of course, you know, was to come to prominence in later years, uh, he was with Fulham at the time. And around the time of the Norway game in 1985, he expressed an interest in declaring for the Republic. But for some reason, on hand, I never followed up on it. Yeah. So maybe if Owen Hand had followed up on it there and then, he might have eased the pressure on Owen somewhat. It fed into the perception as well, which some critics used as a stick to beat Owen Hand with, was that he was loyal to a particular core of players. And rightly or wrongly, this was levelled as a criticism against him. So John, over the, the course of this season in particular, there's uh, until that last game against Switzerland... There's very few goals being scored as well. That's Do you think right. that was yeah, yeah, the, yeah. yeah the, possibly the major weakness? Um, yeah, because I mentioned in my earlier podcast that um, throughout 1984 and 1985, uh, the Republic played 16 games and they only scored eight goals. So that yeah. really kind of you know was a country itself. Because I mean, Mickey Walsh, for instance, I mean he played his last game. In the Denmark game of November 84, he didn't play for Ireland again, although by that stage he was 32, so you could say he was past his peak. And then Frank Stapleton, even though he was a magnificent servant to the Republic, he wasn't a prolific international goal scorer. Yeah, when you mentioned Ray Houghton, another player who would later play for the Republic was John Aldridge. And this was yes. one of his best seasons. Uh, Oxford got promoted and he was the top scorer in, in that division. Was he available at this time? Had that had he been approached, do you know? Because well, he might have also made a difference to this team. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, he wasn't approached. Now, whether that was down to kind of maybe kind of a lack of knowledge on, from, from the Irish side that someone like John Aldridge was eligible to play or maybe it was maybe down to the, maybe the, the drawn power of Charlton. I mean, I mean, it's really hard to know because I'll come to this actually in the next podcast. But throughout this time, you see, on hand, he was kind of, he never really knew from game to game, you know, what players were available to him. Because, like, there was no such thing in those days of having somebody walking in the FEI offices in Dublin the weekend before an international game which internationals tend to be played midweek in those days. There was nobody in the FAI who would, the weekend before the game, uh, check with the various clubs in and as to did players pick up injuries and who, say, was available, say, for the for the upcoming in, international game in midweek and who wasn't. And in actual fact, now I'll go into this in more depth in the next podcast because we could spend a bit of time talking about this, but on hand actually states that uh, for most of his time as under manager, the, the Saturday before in a midweek international game, uh, he would go to a first division game in England, right, where you might have maybe the most Republic fans internationals are playing. He might pick a particular game where you may have three or four internationals playing. When that game was over, he then would have to go into the, maybe the director's suite or the director's box in these particular stadiums, ring a lot of other grounds to see, did any Irish players pick up injuries? And in actual fact, when Owen Hand was doing this, Owen Hand used kind of concentrate on the London area and the south of England to, to attend games. And his assistant, Terry Conroy, would go to games in the north of England. 
I think Terry was based in Stoke at this time or, or that area. So Terry would have concentrated in the north of England and he would have done the same thing because on one occasion, actually, Owen Hand was at a first division game and he was actually alongside Bobby Robson. So when the game was over anyway, I, I think it could have been a game at White Hart Lane. Owen Hand actually um, had to kind of make his excuses to Bobby Robson that he had to go, you see, and go into the director's box and make a few phone calls to see had any Irish players people up injuries. And Bobby Robson couldn't believe that Owen Hand had to do that because Bobby Robson said that, you know, there was a designated person within the English FA who was tasked with that. Whereas Owen and Terry Conroy were having to do it all themselves. What Owen said was that, you see, by not kind of doing this, you were leaving yourself open then, you see, to maybe getting phone cards on, on Sundays or whatever, or, or, or in these Monday mornings if players didn't show up and you would have to chase then as to why you'd, you'd contact the clubs then as to why players didn't show up and then you would be informed that they had picked up an awkward, picked up an injury or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it was really kind of, it was really an amateurish setup, but um, it didn't reflect well on DFEI at the time and there isn't really much more that can be said about that really, unfortunately. Only it did not, needless to say, it did not lend itself to kind of the Republic of Ireland becoming a serious international player in international football. For at least a few years, at least. That's right. Is there any, any other points or questions that you two gentlemen would like to make? I guess for me, as I stated earlier, the fact that Outlook didn't look good. And maybe the win over Switzerland kind of masked some of their deficiencies that they had before. Yeah. But then, Shahan, you could counter that too by saying that the win against Switzerland, it did mask some deficiencies. But then that was the only game where Owen Hand had his squad together for 10 days before the match. So he, he really could invest a lot of time into pairing the team and going through tactics with him or whatever. As he said at one stage, he said, you know, for instance, if they had qualified for a major tournament, he would have had, like, say, the World Cup 1982, he would have had the team for maybe five weeks before the tournament. So he could really have spent a lot of time, you know, kind of with preparation and discussing tactics and devising formations and game strategies and so on. When as he often said, you know, kind of, you did not know for sure until the Monday, until the Monday before an international game on the Wednesday, you know, how many, how many players you had available. That was um, a handicap as well. Paul, what are your takeaways from this season? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting listening to John. Obviously, there's a lot going on off the pitch, which possibly explains why I think the Republic are underperforming in, at this time. Because when you look at the team, certainly looking at it, as an English football fan at the time, there's a lot of players playing for top English teams and their, their first choice players at Liverpool, Manchester United, Arsenal, Tottenham, Everton, a lot of very good players and they don't seem to be performing so consistently when they're, when they're playing for Ireland. But I think that John's obviously explained a lot that's going on behind the scenes that's probably resulting in, in that underperformance. Yeah, and but then you see as well, Paul, you see, unfortunately then, with some sections of the media and some sections of the supporters, this was kind of misconstrued that these players were not really interested in playing for the Republic. Yeah, yeah, there's that as well. Uh, and, and as you said, yeah. them, they're under pressure when they are playing Stapleton and Brady and people, they've got a lot of expectation yeah. to carry. Yeah. And then, of course, a quick, and, and I'll just mention this quickly again, because I, I, I did go into it in my previous podcast, the fact as well that, that Northern Ireland performed so well in qualification tournaments at this time, so without a smaller pool of players to choose from, that was adding to the pressure on own hand and, shall we say, at the better known Republic of Ireland international players as well. Yeah, that, that's true. Arguably, they had a less strong pool of players to, to pick from at that time. So that was uh, the state of Irish international soccer at all of our uh, 35 years ago at this stage. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah, how to, how to believe it's 35 years ago now, but I suppose, you know, kind of, uh, it's a sign of the wage, you know, the times have gone quickly ever since. And thankfully for the most part, anyway, after 1985, once 1985 was out from 86 when Jack Charlton took over, uh, you know, kind of the fortunes of the Republic team gradually improved. So kind of the good days were just a few years away, as it were. Well, our next podcast will obviously touch up on the end of the Owen Hand era and the yes. transition into the Jackie Charlton era. 
Yes, indeed. Um, and indeed, the whole process as well, Shahan, which which almost would be what an entire podcast in itself, you know, the whole process as to how Chat Charlton became. Oh, <laughs> yes. The voting and <laughs> all quite, that. Yeah. Quite a story in it. Yes, There's yes. a lot of stories mm. to discuss for that. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. We'll discuss those all next time in depth and in detail, like we always do. Once again, we would like to thank Mr. O'Carroll for his participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. I can be contacted on my blog and Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle is on Twitter at 1888letter and also his blog, the blog, the 1888letter. You may follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. O'Carroll can be contacted on email. His address is johnocarroll0 at gmail.com and also on Facebook under John O'Carroll. Again, as always, all this information is listed on the Spotify and uh, blog upload. So, John, thank you once again for your the depth of the knowledge that you have on Irish football and it's always we always learn something new whenever we discuss these things. So thank you once again. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And and thank you once again, Shahan. Oh, it was a pleasure and a privilege to be in part of these podcasts. So thank you very much. And of course, you know, a huge thank you also to Paul because it kind of uh, it's much easier discussing the game. You know, when you are discussing this, you know, with knowledgeable people, because mm-hmm. unfortunately, unfortunately, in awful all sense, kind of a lot of other podcasts, kind of these days in a general sense, you kind of they tend to be listeners. You know, with waffle and. Or maybe people not having really such the topics, you know, maybe maybe as well as they should have. But, you know, kind of through your soccer nostalgia podcasts, you know, as, as I said to you, I listen to them all every week or every second or, or whenever they go up. And, I, and, I, and, and I've enjoyed each and every one of them quite immensely. And I mean, kind of a massive respect to you and to Paul as well, you know, for getting such an array of uh, knowledgeable speakers from all parts of the globe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, mm. that's. Thank you, John. It's very interesting to us as well. Mm. And with that, we say goodbye until next time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, goodbye, gentlemen. Thanks for having goodbye. me. Bye, John.